Hello, hello. So, yesterday we did a bit with logistics for the world building. It's that time now to take a look at uh, the NPC characters, most of which we already have named, some of which we have not. We've got a few things to develop out and a few things that the module has already done that for us. Uh, we're using a foundational module, we're using contingency. So it makes it a lot quicker uh, to continue to follow that format straight through. So let me uh, see if we can pull it up. And it pulls it up just fine. Now we get the actual full screen here, which is useful. Let me see if I can scooch that. Just kind of rearrange it a bit. I think that'll be good. So you can see it. So this is uh, an older template, but basically it's one that can be used often. When I start with uh, dealing with modules and I have to decide what I want the space to do, and then I figure out what do I need in it for it to be able to do that. So for our module, we have a few things happen. Uh, at the beginning of the module, the design for the foundation was to use three separate things working against each other to start with. Two of which would branch down and become allies in some fashion, working together, working in some way, and become something, right? So that carries through the entirety of that foundational design. That's how foundational design works. You build a foundation and you replicate each layer of it over and over and over again until you start to build beyond the foundation. So for us with contingency, we use 357 to build foundational modules. We use 357 to build a lot of uh, the formulas within the space. And the reason we do that is so that each layer is supporting the next continuing to remember the first. That way it's a self-supporting structure and it allows you to continue to keep building, building as much as you want. You build a skyscraper. You could build a little tiny house, right? We're building foundations for whatever the scale needs to have. So foundational NPC characters fall that same bracket. For our module, we began with that open-ended Two parties working, eventually allying. If they do so, the third entity doesn't have a chance to defeat them, overcome them, what have. But three parties moving, right? We put them in motion, and we require them to remain in motion until the module is done, or we move on to a different section. So NPC characters, uh, when you're building them foundationally, you want to stick with the basics. You want to name them. Obviously, they have some purpose. They're a foundational character. NPC characters, foundationally, have a name. They have a description. It doesn't have to be anything too extreme. They have a brief background. We're building foundational. We're not developing massive amounts of lore or story with them. We are setting them up to be able to do that. What is their motivation in the space? What drives them forward? What is the thing that puts them in motion and keeps them there? And then what is their influence on the world space? Again, all brief, nothing too extreme. We're dealing with the increments of five. So if I was dealing with just the increments of three and I reduced it down to an even more basic concept, I would probably not even deal with the character directly. I would be dealing with an area and the people of that space. So what are the people in that particular area doing? What motivates them? And what is their influence on the world? I'll leave it at that. I wouldn't add any other layers. They're the foundation. When you extract a character out of that population, an NPC character, just like how a, a player would extract a character out of the world space. 
you're taking the population and, and focusing down upon it, adding a few more layers of detail. In this instance, we're building a foundational platform. Right? So we're dealing with 3, 5, and 7. We're dealing with contingency. So for us, we're dealing with 5 at this point. We'll add the other two layers when we begin to develop things further to them. Allies and such. But this is the most basic. We have three covered. We've extracted them from the population. We know population motivation. It has a bit of logistics attached to it. We're carrying over that logistics, which we covered yesterday's strand, into this space when we're extracting and dealing with NPC characters. What is the logistics of this character? How are they moving about the space and what does that do? How does that happen? What makes them do that? If we developed it out on this particular page for foundational out to seven, we would have specified them too much. So we have to rein it back, at least for now. A foundational builder like this, seven technically is being covered. We know what adventure module we're placing it in, and we know who has created them for reference or their creation date, right? Those other two elements, which brings it up to seven, is technically covered in this aspect as far as what we're designing. I'm not just building random characters that I'm going to extract for later use. If I was doing that, then I would require the other two components, right? I would require it up to seven. I would need to know... Where is this person typically found and located? Location, right? And then I would need to know when did they begin or possibly end? What is the duration of their story? In this instance, we're covering that in a very generic space because it's foundation. So all I need to know for the NPC character specifically is description, name, background, motivation, and influence, those top five things. The adventure module and the creator or date created, working in tandem, covers it out to seven foundation, so that we are clear on how that works. So we have a couple of characters that we already know, so we're going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to make sure that I do this different I did this the last time. And I will save this as... That way we have it, and I don't have to go back and edit the foundation. So what waits beneath is the module in which we're using these characters. It's where their story begins. But I can also go back and say, well, maybe I don't want it to be an adventure module. Maybe I want this to change, and I want this to be a world space instead. I can change that. Because we're going to be using them a little farther than that. So the world space, and the world space is Grico. We know this. Date created remains the same. We started creating them at that point. So we have, and we know this, 10 mages on both ends in reality. And I've got the pages allocated for them. And we will actually be doing several of these because we have a few other things to deal with. But we're going to start today with the mages. So we have uh, the first mage, Iral, and he, he is dubbed the first, right? So we add that in. And we have a description to deal with. We have a background, motivation, and their influence. Well, we know what their influence was. Iral was the first mage. We organize. The order of mages, allocating out positions of power within the multitude magical influence.
So he was the first mage to organize the Order of Mages. Branch this out a bit more. Okay. Allocating out positions of power multi uh, within the multitude of magical influence. He is the reason the mythal was created in Versailles. So he is the first mage, first to begin to organize some semblance, right? And what was his motivation to do so? Well, he was motivated by uh, the Dark Lands influence. Uh, Gryffor prevented life expansion. And I'll type this, then I'll read it back so that you can see it, just in case it doesn't show up enough on there. I, I suppose I could zoom it in a bit. I think I might be able to see it. Give it a sec and see if it pulls that up. Yeah, it pulls it up. I'll just shuffle back and forth so you guys can see it. So, Darklands, okay, the Darklands' influence upon Greek War prevented life expansion. War had to be led on multiple planes of existence in order to drive them. Proved difficult. Um, let's see. So, the Darklands' influence upon Grigor prevented life expansion. A war had to be led on multiple planes of existence in order to drive them back. The Shadowlands proved difficult, and the Order was created. Aral led the first and the last stages of the world's towers. So all of those towers that were created, those are the things that began and ended under his guidance and influence. So, Aral's background. Ah, move the mouse. It's one thing with the desk at the angle it is the mouse likes to take a walk. <laughs> I'll have to get a little um, tab or something underneath there just to keep it where I am. So, a background. Let's see. Iral is birthed with magic. So, Okay, we'll, we'll reword this a bit. We're dealing with foundation. So, what we say has to build more than what we have decided. So, let's see.
just to stop blinking out. So, so, born with a natural attunement to magic, Aral became a conduit of these varied forces early on. With some guidance from the world, Aral became a well-known and powerful mage. He discovered the realms of the dark and was the first to venture there and back. That's basically his background. So, with each piece of these core components, background, motivation, and influence, we're not only deciding certain key components, the highlights, but they are also developing things beyond that. So with a natural attunement to magic, we've placed something within the world space that can build other spaces. And these varied forces, right, depicts that in the world space there are more than just one. That builds more things as well. With some guidance from the world, what guidance, right? So that builds the opportunity for us as a designer, DMGMGO, right? An idea being placed to build from other things. So he became a well-known and powerful mage, pretty self-explanatory. He discovered the realms of the dark, which we know about, and was the first to venture there and back. So if he was the first, that means that others, right, story-wise, ventured there and back as well. Motivation-wise, we say the Dark Lands influence upon Grigor prevented life expansion. A war had to be led. It's history and a tidbit. A war. Something, right? On multiple planes of existence. Again, we're building a platform that allows other things to happen. So there's other planes in the world of Grigor. The Shadowlands, depicting one of those planes, proved it difficult, and the order was created. That means that the war had some difficulties to it, and things began to change. I've got to plug the computer. On it. Trying to get this file all set up. Take a second. Okay. So Aral led the first and the last stages uh, of the world's towers. He also created that order, right? In his influence, he was the first mage to organize the Order of Mages, obviously. We've addressed that in their motivation. And the reason why he created them. Allocating out positions of power within the multitude of magical influence. So he knows that there are those that are superior in the specific fields. And he allocates out them accordingly. Uh, and he is the reason the method was created in herself. We depict that 100%. So, description. Mages tend to be fairly unique. Wizards tend to be fairly unique. They have a foundation to them, usually something that defines them, but as world spaces are built, that can get changed and allocated to whatever that branding happens to be for that world space. In this world space, we're dealing with things more uh, fantastical, medieval, so, when I describe Aral, I want to add some of those layers in and provide some of that foundation. He's the first. Others may follow in suit to his example, right? His leadership. So, Aral is well-built and... So, Aral is well-built and combat-worthy without magic. So, he's not a stick, right? He knows his weapons. He knows physical and mental capacity. Tactics as well.
And I'll expand this just a bit out so that it will space properly. Like so. So, Aral is well built and combat worthy without magic. Magic is not. I'll fix that. Like so. Magic is not his defining feature, but one that supports his way. With a sword in hand and staff, Aral and his intricate adorned robes house many tomes of collected lore and myth. That's simple. We're not depicting anything else beyond that. We don't have to. He's foundation. So he's well built. Combat worthy. With or without magic. Magic is not the thing that he begins what he does. Magic is something that he uses to support what he is doing. He has a sword and he has a staff. And he has many tomes located under his robes. So most likely... The robes have some magical expansion to them, allowing him to hold all of these different tomes within his robes. So he is a well-versed individual. I am assigning him the gender of man in this instance. But it's my decision to do that. The DM, GM, or GO could change the gender and it not change anything else about the sort. Gender is not carry that much weight. It is not a thing that has to define that space specifically. I'm just adding it in foundation. So, Aral is the first, and we have the second. Levithos. No subname. He's basically a wizardy. We have description, background, motivation, and influence. So, motivation, I'm going to start with here. So we have to build a space in such a way that it builds more space when we're dealing with foundation. So motivation-wise, Levithix, a supporting caster to Aral's might. Levithix is as much a friend as ally. Staff in hand, he and Aral braved the Darklands in search of its source and battled for the world of Grikor with the rest of the Order. He helped to define much of the world's lore and collect it for future mages. That's his motivation. His motivation is he is Aral's friend. He is also Aral's ally. And the Dark Lands, they were motivated to search for the source within it. And make, basically, war against that space to try to end its influence. He's also motivated to collect as much lore as he can for mages of the future, realizing there is a finite end even for a mage. So his influence Uh, 
add find uh, first skip I'll just add a add a elegance of things. So diligence might not be enough. I'll use a different word. It will bother me that it sets there. So let's see. Is uh, We want it to be as it is. So the lore of Grigor owes much to Levithix. His persistence to attain and archive the happenings and findings of Grigor helped build civilizations and the Order of Mages. That's his influence. So background. Trying to think how I would like that to occur. How does Eral find Levithix and build that friendship before the Order was even formed. Okay, because I want, I want there to be a reason they were brought together, right? Because we're building a foundational space. So in the module, when you create characters, NPC characters, player characters, uh, major villains, what have you, if you're doing so foundation, we are here. Like I said, the, the idea is to create more story than what you depict. You're creating other opportunities to expand that which you have started to define. So even as you add more details, it continues to expand, right? If you don't do that, if you forget the general concepts of things and over-specify, they become the general concept. So specific beats general is layman's terms, more or less. It's a reminding factor that if you specify something too much, it then, if it defeats the general concept, it becomes the general concept, and it's no longer specific. And you have to start once again. 
why have the general concept if you're going to specify it out that far? It is a self-checking system, one that Gary created very well. It is designed to keep you from doing too much, just enough, because it should always continue to create and support what was already placed. Never ever should it replace that general concept unless you are rebuilding the foundation. And if you are doing so, then it should have began with that, or should begin with that instead, and not even add the layers that you had previously. Otherwise, it's a self-destructive system. That's why Gary put that in place for Dungeons & Dragons. You don't want the system to be self-destructive. A self-destructive system has an end. In order to make it not end, and to give it that organization, flow, and forward thought process, you have to remember that the general concept remains, no matter how many times you specify. There will always be a general concept. If specific beats general, literally, the specific concept now is the general concept, and the process begins again. So, Conduits of Magic drew a Rawl to Levithix and Levithix to a Rawl. Once found, they could not be separated. Their friendship flourished and their power grew. Much adventure drew, from, drew them from their homeland in Versailles. So we've depicted a few things in there. This leads to the discovery of the planes of existence. So we gave some options in there as well. So Magic Conduits brought other other things. So magic has the capability to draw other things that are magical towards each other. Individuals wielding magic will be able to sense others wielding magic as well. It's what we've added a layer in there. We've hinted at that concept. And once they are brought to that space and they've made that connection, then they realize that connection is there. It doesn't go away. So in this instance, their power uh, began to grow based off of them being friends and allies with each other. Their power began to grow together. Uh, they became basically, in my mindset, of how I allocated out the power of magic within the space. Magic being used together sort of flocks itself together and begins to grow in unison instead of individually. So if one form of magic is growing, and another form is not, but it is discovered, it will then catch up, and the two will grow together. It's a sort of checks and balance system in the magical world that means that nothing else is getting left behind. Magic will continue to work as long as magic is working together. If it is being separated, if it is being pulled apart, it will slow and diminish until it doesn't exist. So, much adventure drew them from their homeland in Versailles. So, Aral and Levithix had adventures prior to creating the Mage Order. And those adventures led them to the discovery of the planes of existence. So they were out doing things, adventuring about and doing whatever. Could be anything that they were doing. And they discover these planes of existence. They find the shadow realms, and they find the dark ones, both in the process. Venturing through, and Aral was the first to return back. So if the both of them went in, and Aral was the first to return, perhaps Levithix remained, and that's when the Mage Order was created, and he went back with the Mage Order to get him back out. He couldn't get him out himself. Maybe something happened. That's a possible story. Right? We're building foundational, and this is how that process works. It gives ideas of things that can happen. So I have to do a little bit of scooching here. Let's see. I have to do it like this, I guess. Shrink that down a bit. Yeah, so you can see it. Just because this side's sort of covered by 
I might be able to go zoom back up. See if that pulls it down. Look at string. Oh yeah. So I can scooch it up a bit. Make sure. Looks like it. We're good. Perfect. Okay. So description wise, again, following suit, uh, keeping it what it is. A ways back, uh, I'd say probably seven years or so, I actually created uh, a few things, and I like to utilize them as much as I can. Let's see if I can get that up there. I'll move this just a hair this way. Might have to do an adjustment. Two, seven point eight. Then I should be able to scooch this back. So, not noticeable scale. Okay. So a ways back, I created some different things. When I thought about magic in general, and I thought about how do things happen. Or how can they have? What are some possibilities? To give a visual description of magic happening. A person with magic. What are some signs that shows that they may be magical? Or have some magical thing about them in nature? And I thought about sort of like a living parchment. A, a tome that appears in pages, not bound, constantly being shuffled and rummaged through, sort of disorganized, but living, in essence, with magic. That it can itself do things and move about. And it is, in a way, an assistant to scribing down information. Perhaps a spell or a scroll appears and rolls parchment scribes things upon it, and then disappears. An effect that a mage like Levithix would be using in this instance. So I said Levithix is long of beard and hair, well kept and neat, some might say magically so. Adding some tidbits of story. His adornments match similarly to a raw with robe and staff. Though tomes Levithix does not carry, a flurry of parchment appears at his domain. Right, should he need it? describe these lists and such of all of this information that he has been keeping is all within these random pages. And he could create tomes like this. Well, that book is done, or that spell needs to be remaining in a scroll. Done. I need to repeat that scroll. I have several copies. Done. This is what Levithix's magic does. This is what he can do. Aral's magic isn't of that nature. His is more combat direct oriented. Though he has a range of spells, he's a mage, not a wizard. He does things in a more direct fashion, where Levithix is a wizard. Levithix retains some of these things and has a more magical approach to things, where a mage has a more physical approach first, first and foremost. Typically, the idea of magic as a tool instead of a, as a means to do something. 
So, Vahafor. And we know that Vahafor actually has a purpose. Creation magic. So, how do we want to start that? I'm thinking background itself. Uh, because of how he is found. We have several male mages so far. We will have female mages. And we'll have other gendered mages also. We're dealing with the three. Purposeful. These ones here are the ones that ended up passing in the creation of the myth. So they have a particular story tied to the space. And they could be changed. Like I said, the gender doesn't necessarily matter. I'm just depicting it in the way that I'd say. So background. Uh, I'm going to say... We have to give some layering there that makes sense, right? Foundation. So, Behafor, I said background lines. Found among the masons and crafters of ages past. Behafor had a knack for creating things. Not all by tool in hand, but by magic's guidance and influence. His expertise in intricate and elaborate structures caused him to be sought by Aral and Levithix when exploring the world. They found stuff that was not their area of expertise, and they sought Vahafor out and brought him there, thus finding that Vahafor also has magic and was wielding it. So,
So the standing stones of the Druids of, of Grickle were a driving factor for Vahafor to join the Order. The strange stonework and intricate monoliths of the other planes, too, were best addressed by his expertise. This knowledge saved a world and its people, so his motivation was that his expertise was being recognized, and he knew that without his expertise in that instance, they would not make it. So it's that uh, self-reassurance that helped to bring that about. So influence. Um, let's see. I'll say nations, generalized. So the towers of Grikor as conduits began as Vehafor's vision. Guided by the findings of Aral and Levithix, they successfully build a lasting barrier between the worlds and later nations. I'll change it to built as past tense. Um, let's see. So description. So, much less magical in appearance, Behafor has an assortment of tools much like an archaeologist or mason sculptor, right? His work can be found all across the Shattered Kingdom. So he's constantly doing something. That was his thing. Most of the structures was probably created with or, or around his guidance or suggestion. He was the mason. The person that created these intricate things using magic in some form to create them. A lot of that structural magic that helped to create that lasting effect on the city of Brussel came from Vahofor's magic. Levithix's knowledge base of that and Aral's knowledge of the planes. 
So, those are the three that became forgotten, right? The Fallen. They lose their namesake and become known as the Fallen. And they become known as the Fallen for a reason, because they fell. They disappeared from existence in order to save the world space. We don't define them literally being gone, but we suggestively impact in the module, we say, that they became part of the myth of Rawl specifically, as if his hand reaches down and places the stones back where they go every time a stone of the city of Vercel falls. This is where this goes, and he picks it up and puts it back. That would mean that he has expanded past his mortal space into something else a sort of yoda mentality where he becomes part of the thing that he once wielded and that could be a thing he could also be somewhere else in the shadowlands or in the darklands the shadow realms dark lands. could be in either one that could be a thing. They were there before. Perhaps that's where they are. And their mortal form is gone. So there's a lot of story openings we leave there. And we don't just take that time and define that all out specifically. We want to leave some room in there for some cool things to happen, influence-wise. Let them create a bit, too. I don't want to make it that rigidly designed. Because then it's not a foundational module. It changes into a different type of so, we have a few other mages that we know about, but they're not in the allegiance of these mages. So there's three, and we know there's a total of ten. So, we have seven other mages. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, we'll scroll down, because we have a few mages of the other end that we know about already. Bakamos. We know. We know Vakamos is second in command, Targari. And we know the third in that instance. Lithra. So These two mages literally die in the process. There's no way that they're returned. When the mythal is created, Levithix, Vahafor, and Aral end up defeating them to the point that they are just no more. Bakamos, on the other hand, of that instance, his magic gets shattered, broken apart, divided. And he has no other chance to maintain what he is but locking them away in these different relics, these things that he locks himself into, puts fragments of his power into them in that instance in order to save what he is. Otherwise, he's done as well. In order to keep himself somewhat alive, he does that in the instance in which he is dismissed. As he is sent back to the Dark Lands. In Vercel, when that happens, that magical ripple creating the mythal and everything else also shatters the kingdom. It divides it. Perhaps the mountain range has become taller. Uh, the river system becomes wider. Whatever, right? The bridge shatters. Uh, an echo, a ripple, ripples out, and the bridge comes crashing down. Uh, perhaps the bridge that uh, our boy there, Vahafor, had some influence over. Maybe one that he actually had some actual physical impact. Not just magical, but physical. And maybe in that instance, much of Vahafor's things he created shattered as well it was that much of a strain that he was actually keeping those things going it could be 
the layering could be that deep, but we're dealing with foundational. We don't want to depict it out that far. I thought about it earlier today. And what happens when the ripple spreads from the location? That sort of magical nuclear detonation and that fight between the two forces, right? The tearing apart that magical influence. What does that do to the space? How could it do these things? And what might that look like? So we're dealing with these characters foundationally, and we want to make sure that we're offsetting them properly. So Vakamos has a background, motivation, influence, and description as well. And it needs to be on par with the weight of Eratz, if he is to be a contender against him. So description-wise, we had described some of them already inside the module. Hate that it jumps back up, but it does. All right, be able to see that in there. So, Bacamus or Bacamos's adornments billow like smoke, and his footsteps leave a lingering shadow upon the world. A shadow lord from the dark lands, boundaries of the worlds cannot contain. He is a masked lord of that realm, and I may add that later in description. Background. Spell check. Um, let's see. So, Vakamos was birthed in the dark lands. He is as much bound to it as a soul might be to an afterlife or ascension. He has waged a lasting war upon the world of Grickle from his tower in the dark lands for multitudes of worlds life. He is known as he is, an ancient, because that's what he is. That is the race that he is. They are known as 
ancients. They're borderline deatypic. They last beyond. They are mortal. They're not from the material plane. You could kind of consider them like a lich in their defiance of what life is. So, motivation. So we have to develop at least something, a tidbit, beyond just a hatred of, because that's too easy. So the Dark Lands are a lingering realm. Eventually one realm or the other must dominate, or its influence upon the other fate. The Dark Lands hang on to the world of Grigor by the threads of the Shadow Realms. Should that connection end? So too with the Dark Lands and its inhabitants. So there is a ticking time clock to the existence of the Dark Lands. Once it existed throughout the multitude of that space, and later on it eventually became less. It started to change because civilization started to expand, and that caused action to be had beyond the realm. And that is when Aral began to explore the space because it became more open as things were coming through. Perhaps he followed something in. He couldn't open the door, but found a way in. And then perhaps used those same conduits to get back out, fleeing from Vakamos, knowing that Vakamos is something that he should not be messing with alone. So, influence. So I put, um, I, I can see that it's cut off a bit. Um, let me see if there's a way I can, should be able to do some shuffle. Let me scale this a bit. Should be able to get it to where it fits. Like. That gives us about the largest scale. Oh yeah, so you can see that pretty well. And I can scooch it up. Just have to shuffle it a little bit. So, Vakamos drives the leadership of the Shadow Lords. 
capable of binding them to the material world and influencing magics and items thereof in that space. Nakamos is a lasting threat. To be clear, that he isn't something that's taken care of in a module, but it would be something addressed across multiple modules, not just a one trick pony kind of situation, right? So, Targari. We already know Targari is a fire master. Something bound beyond. So, other forms of magic. Destructive, right? So, adorned with the hide of a red dragon, Targari leads a cult of fire-worshipping extremists that bind elemental and magical objects to themselves out of passion for pain and destruction. Extremists. You know, they'll sever off their own arm and bind something to that location if they feel the need warrants it. Background. So, Targari is a destructive force, leading his extremists across the world of Grikor, leaving fire in their wake. Even that which a dragon wields has yet to tame Targari's thirst for destruction. The realm of monsters birthed such a being as Targari. He's not from the other planes. He's from this one, born in the area of where the monsters reside. Leaving it in such a fashion that we don't describe Targari too much, perhaps making Targari something more than human in semblance. 
Remember, monstrous realm. Motivation. Let's see what this thing thinks. So, uh, let's do a little bit of adjustment. Yeah. Oops. Don't slide on me. I want to save this too. That would suck. Okay, lasting things infuriate Targar. His cultists share this passion. When the first settlements began, it was Targari forces that assailed them. This destructive nature is what drew Vakamos to Targari, and an allegiance was formed, a weapon aimed and a weapon tended by Vakamos. Targari is a weapon of Vakamos, an entity of destruction. Influence. Let's see. So I said... Tagari forces slowed the progress of civilization over many ages. Not bound by mortal life, Tagari outlived most that existed. Tagari has burned the world many times over. So, things that existed, Tagari has destroyed, except the city of Versailles and that civilization. Other things before that time were being destroyed as it was trying to expand or be created. Now, Lithal. Lithril is sort of like a necromancer. So,
So, darkened and tattered robes, dangling totems and trinkets, a collection of skulls magically altered. Lithril reeks of death, and death responds to Lithril's presence. Lithril is a master of death. That's simple. Background. So, ages passed, things fell, but were never quite lost. Keepers, as they were called in the Dark Ages, tended to that which had fallen. Their mastery of death was so perfected that their trade became an art. Potions, rituals, packs, and more prolonged or even defied death, or rewarded it. So, in that age, when the Dark Lands had so much influence. Things didn't fall and become forgotten as often as they do without the Dark Ages' presence, per se. They remained. Corpses would decay at a much slower rate, if at all. They may just lay the litter amongst the space. Uh, swarms of ravens or crows circling above, right? Scavengers feasting. Until even bones, right? Upon the surface, never sinking quite beneath. A reminder, right? So, in that time frame, when the Dark Lands had presence in the material world, more than it did now, this occurred. So as it slipped back and was forced back into the Dark Lands, these keepers, right, is what we have called them, gave them a name. Instead of calling them something that is already known, create something new and give it a little bit more of a story context. Perhaps a class, particularly, could be. We're developing some things. It's foundation. We're using these characters to help build some other things in our space. So... The idea would be that as things became more finite instead of infinite, their collection became slimmer. And that being their motivating factor, the thing that sustained them, they wish it to return. So,
So I said, sustained life does not support a keeper. They relish in decay and feast on the remnants of life. Lasting life, protected life, goes against what they are. As the dark lands faded behind the shadow, keepers, such as Lithra, sought other means to claim fallen things. Right? It's what they do. So influence. So in the one module that I'm working on, I have several that support this module we're working on. These things in the shadow realm are pushing through. Uh, And they, it's sort of like how I described it in the module was if you had like a, a bed sheet draped down on a clothesline and you were behind it and you started pushing yourself through and reaching through it. It's sort of like that. Think of the drapery, the bed sheet, as the boundary between the planes. And you're in there and you're clawing and trying to move your way through and you can see outlines and such of your shape. If there was someone on the other side, you could reach through and grab a hold of them and pull them towards you, having them inside that boundary, uh, trying to tug them through that drapery, maybe even wrapping them inside that space. could end them even in that potential. They could struggle to get free. The fabric could get torn depending on the strength of their connection and your strength in coming through that tapestry. And that same thing applies when we're dealing with this. We're trying to build a foundation, so we're doing a few things. So I said, keepers walk between worlds. The shadow realm is what birthed them. From there, Lithril and those things of the world of shadow grasp through to the world of mortal life. That's how the influence happens. Lithril is in that plane, and that is where they exist. Sustained by the fall of life, basically. So, those are the ones we have and know based off of what we have designed thus far in the module or modules. That is what we have decided in the world space. And we will decide more, uh, but we'll take pause for a minute. Kind of go over some of these things because we'll continue this uh, and and flush them all out. We want to get all ten of each completed and done. We need that, and then we'll go through and we'll do another one of these same things uh, with these foundational builders. But we'll do the heirs and such for the kingdom, the ones that we know, and perhaps we'll deal with some of those uh, other entities that exist that have some worldly relevance and weight. So, foundational characters, NPC characters, in this instance, when we're deciding what to depict, we're trying not to tell the entire story. Because a foundational structure isn't the entirety. It is just the foundation. The foundation in which the rest of the thing can be depicted. It's a great training tool to help back the story up a bit. When I have new players decide 
what their background happens to be, what their motivation is, their influence, their description. I help I have them build characters foundationally and then expand on that. There's no 20 page backstories and crap like that happening in a space that's just beginning. A lot of these new age players that start to play think, and even ones back in the day, we you have to rein them in sometimes. They think the whole story's been told and they're only level one. And that's not the case. There is no story told yet. They're not beginning at level 20 or level 100, right? The contingency system has an exponential uh, capability. We're not limited by levels 1 through 20. I have the entire system built out to level 100 with a systematic uh, extreme calculation that allows it to expand even farther. Basically endless gameplay, infinite amount of levels. Things happen across that span. Players make choices. DMs, GMs, and GOs make choices on how that expansion happens. They can play up to a certain point and reset if they choose to. And the resets allow things to happen within the game space of contingency. We have some interesting things in place that allows characters to become legendary aspects. And these wraparounds of their lifespan, their areas of influence that they create within the world space, allows them to have a longer duration of life beyond just mortal. They start to expand and things happen. These effects occur on the reset. They are level 1 characters, and they have these certain buffs that can happen when they become legendary. Legendary has mechanic attached, and that isn't the only thing. They could ascend, they could become deities, things like that, and there's all lore and world space mechanics that helps that occur and, and occur consistently. So, foundational characters, like I said, are the platform in which that character can be developed further. I have some sheets that I do uh, foundational characters on. A good way to sort of remind that space and have another reference to it is random NPCs, right? You make a list, and how do you build that list? Well, you build it foundationally. If you're going to do it properly, you want to limit it. But a lot of times they don't. They build them as a story extraction or a story... Um, impacting specific. They forget to build it foundationally. They start it out that way, and then by the time it's done, it's not foundational. We've built these foundational because we need them to tell other tales besides just this. We need the story to expand, and we need them to be able to influence other layers of the world itself through their suggested Description, background, motivation, influence. Name is the name. You could have a list of names. It's not as impactful as a list of names with a description or names with some layer of motivation. As you add these other layers, it becomes more, right? So we're using 357 to build a foundational space. That's what this is. We've depicted out 6 and 7 being the world space and the creation point of entrance. Everything else is three and five. We know what those things are because we're expanding it to that point. We need it to be that because that helps support the rest of the structure we're constructing. In a foundational character, NPC character, the entirety of the story is never going to be told in that space. That's the point of them being foundational. You don't want that entirety to be detailed out. You have to leave room for them to be able to be placed within certain things, for information about them to be extracted and replaced in certain things for a reason. They help build worlds. They're not just part of it. They help it to grow, and they help it to expand, and they help stories to happen. Just by this foundational platform, modules can be created from these characters. Whereas a random NPC list does not do that as consistently as it could if done properly. They do them in a way that supports the system that they run with. 
and it can do so. It does do so. I have used them in the past, but it doesn't do so as well as it could. There is another way. Foundation. And that's what we took a look at today. So, with that being said, we return here and we chit-chat for a moment. So, in the space of Gripla, when we're developing it out, while we're developing it out, we have made some lock-in decisions about limitations and how we want to flesh the world out a bit more. We know there are 10 mages, we know there are 10 shadow lords. We know that they have towers and such. We know that there are other factions that exist, the druids being one of them. And there are others. We have the knights, right? The order of sanctuary that exists. And that's just a tidbit, taste of that space. We know there's more. And dealing with the logistics from the stream yesterday, we also had locked in decision-wise some of these other aspects of that transition from civilized space, humanistic, to semi-humanistic, and then completely monstrous. And there will be entities within those spaces, right? We have Drasham, the Red Dragon. That's an NPC character that has the same things that we were looking at today, and they'll have to be plugged in. And we may depict several of them dragons, right? Maybe one of each kind. Drasham happens to be a Red Dragon. There may be other dragons. In the contingency system, we have several other that are not just chromatic or metallic, right? Because that's sort of the mentality that happens most of the time dealing with dragons. There are so many others. Fourth edition, Dungeons and Dragons took a look at some of them. Uh, but there are so many other systems that can take a look at. They don't have to be locked into that aspect. Dragons take many shapes, right? The current in the realm of Turin, right? Are dragon-like creatures. So that influence of that being what it is can expand out past it. But we have some entities. We know we have the kingdoms, and we're going to be addressing that. In those kingdoms, those realms of the shattered kingdom of herself, we have the heirs, we know who they are, and we have some of those other leaders within that space, stewards of those other realms, and, and how they do what they do in those backgrounds and those stories are going to help us build the world. So we're going to take a look at them foundationally first because it makes more sense to begin at the beginning. We're dealing with a foundational module. We begin at the beginning. If you don't do that and you skip the step, and I've skipped the step myself. I've done so. I've skipped foundational design altogether, and I've went on a whim and done so. By doing that, you are at a great risk of not being consistent within the space, and it starts to show. And you're going to have these random things that you won't be able to keep track of because it's not built foundation. There is no orchestrated structure to it. Foundation design as an orchestrated structure. You're doing things in a particular order, in a particular way for a reason, because you're building those layers upon it. Right? And in order for future layers to be successful, the layer with which it stands must be absolutely perfect. And it can be done easily. We've just done that in real time. Made them completely up randomly. Using some of the support information from the module, we flushed them out in real time quickly. Now I've got over 30 years, well over 30, of creation in the tabletop RPG space. So I have that luxury to do that. It might not be as easy for others to do it, but the process remains the same. The mindset of creating it will help to teach and train that to make that be better by doing it in that sequence. And you can see when we did it, we sh shuffled around. We jumped around a bit. Some we started with a description. Others we started with the influence. It depends on that character's weight being shifted. Where best does their story begin for the imagination to build the space proper? The sequence of it, it's the collection, the entirety of that, that builds them proper. We do things forward, backwards, upside down, inside out, sideways, right? And we did that exactly in here, purposefully. Purposefully selected a different viewpoint 
for each of the characters to make them not be that consistent to each other. I wanted them to be uniquely different. And by doing that, we shifted around and started their story in a different place. Started with influence, started with background, started with motivation. That helps to do that. That helps you to give some defining factor that gets your brainstorm storming so that you can create. Foundational design supports this. Forwards, backwards, upside down, inside out mentality. You are still moving and that is what creates movement is doing so. And we want to do that every time. So later today, because I'm going to head to, to work, my usual. Later today, when we uh, hop back on, we're going to jump in and do some more. And we're going to take a look. We're going to leave this one where it is. We're not going to develop out the other mages or anything just yet. We're taking a look at the information we have first from the module, and then we'll build from it. So we're probably going to jump into uh, the heirs of the kingdom and get the information down that we know about them as well. Log all that information in and have it so that we can expand and fill those gaps for some other things. We're also going to be taking a look at doing some foundational builds for some other characters. And they don't have to be anything but foundational. They can remain foundational for their duration. Other things are not required. A foundational NPC character can stand on its own without developing it any farther past that point. Allow them to be what it is and maintain that throughout that space infinitely. Let's say it's a barkeep, right? Or an innkeeper or a blacksmith. They could remain foundation for their entirety. Interactions can occur from a foundational character without anything else being developed from them. It's not required. We are doing that for some of these characters because they have a space that's continuing to grow and expand. The blacksmith may or may not expand their space. Even though the characters interact with them, there may be a few little tales here and there, but it's not really expanding. It's remaining foundation. They're a support structure of which story can be happening. That's what their purpose is. Instead of just having a list of random NPCs, which may or may not be useful, depending on what happens to be there. A list of foundational NPCs has much more weight and much more usability in that space because they're built with the purpose of building story from them, not placing them in and just filling the gap, but purposefully building something else beyond what they are. So we're going to stop there. I appreciate everyone stopping by. And the next time we stream, we will take a look at uh, more foundational NPC characters. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.